Wonder why most currencies are compared to dollars? How powerful are our currencies? Does gold actually matter? Today, we will learn all of those things by observing the history of international monetary systems. The first internationally recognized monetary system was established during 1803 until 1873, namely the Bimetallism Standard. This standard defined a nation's monetary unit in terms of fixed quantities of gold and silver. It was used when France issued a law of locally used bimetallism for its economics in 1803, and then followed by other European countries in later years. However, each nation could independently set its own rate of exchange between the two metals. This fact led to a classical problem in international use that the resulting rates often differ widely from country to country. In order to overcome this problem, France, alongside with Belgium, Italy, and Switzerland, formed the Latin Monetary Union in 1865 as an attempt to implement the system in a worldwide scale. In the following years, about 20 nations has agreed to join the union. Bimetallism provided a free and unlimited market for gold and silver, imposed no restrictions on the use and coinage of either metal, and made all other money in circulation redeemable in either gold or silver. The system was preferable to monometallism since the combination of two metals provides greater monetary reserves and price stability. It is also easier to determine and stabilize the exchange rates among countries using gold, silver, or bimetallic standards. Nevertheless, the process in mining, handling, and coinage was costly. The amount of demand and supply of the metals was changed over time, but the ratio of the price between both metals still the same. The condition could disrupt the double standard. Finally, the International Monetary Conference held in Paris in 1867 decided to terminate the use of this standard and replace it with a gold standard. The system gradually came to an end with the Franco-German War in the 1870s. Next, let's talk about the gold standard. After the breakup of the bimetallism regime, gold came up as the next standard of the monetary system. Gold coins circulated as domestic currency alongside coins of other metals and notes, with the composition varying by country. In 1821, the UK used this standard early and then reached economic and political dominance in the 1870s. This dominance attracted other countries to enter London's financial markets. Fast forward to the end of the Franco-German War, Germany extracted reparations from France to facilitate a move to the gold standard. Meanwhile, recent gold discoveries in Western North America had made gold more plentiful. The impact of these events encourages many countries to turn it to the gold standard. During the gold standard era, domestic currencies were freely convertible into gold at a fixed price with no restrictions. The exchange rates between participating currencies were also fixed, since each currency has a fixed ratio in terms of gold. Moreover, this standard limited the power of governments to issue paper currency, which could lead to price inflation. It also created certainty in international trade by providing a fixed pattern of exchange rates. The gold standard may not provide enough flexibility in the supply of money due to the irrelativity between the supply of newly mined gold and the growing needs of the world economy. It also prohibited any country to isolate its economy from the inflation or depression. This disadvantages caused the fall of the system along with the beginning of World War I in 1914. The Anchored Dollar Standard During the World War, gold flooded the US economics as a result of ammunition trading with Europe. After the war in 1918, the lack of gold supplies brought Europe into a financial crisis. Meanwhile, the U.S. monetized gold, which doubled the prices. The U.S. dollar became the only major currency and the global economy turned unstable within the gold standard, which led to the U.S. dollar becoming the new international standard. This implies that the U.S. economy expanded rapidly during the 1920s and even doubled between 1920 and 1929. In 1924, Germany went back to gold in its stabilization plan to stop its hyperinflation, followed by Britain in 1925, France in 1926, and several other countries. This condition resulted in excess demand for gold, 
causing deflation in major global economics. Meanwhile in America, the stock market reached its peak in 1929. However, production declined, unemployment had risen, wages were low, food prices fell, and banks had an excess of large loans that could not be liquidated. Investors started to sell their overpriced stocks, which led to the stock market crash. The world faced the Great Depression during 1929 until 1939. Britain adopted gold in 1931, followed by America in 1933 after devaluing the dollar. So the Tripartite Monetary Agreement was established in 1936, creating a new kind of dollar standard, but the dollar was the only currency anchored to gold, and all other countries in the system kept their respective currencies back to dollar only, and the system lasted during 1936 to 1971. The Bretton Woods system of monetary management established the rules for commercial and financial relations among the US, Canada, Western European countries, Australia, and Japan after the 1944 Bretton Woods Agreement. The Bretton Woods system was the worst example of a fully negotiated monetary order intended to govern monetary relations among independent states. The chief features of the Bretton Woods system were an obligation for each country to adopt a monetary policy that maintained its external exchange rates within 1% by tying its currency to gold and the ability of the IMF to bridge temporary imbalance of payments. Also, there was a need to address the lack of cooperation among other countries and to prevent competitive devaluation of the currencies as well. On 15 August 1971, the United States unilaterally terminated convertibility of the US dollar to gold, effectively bringing the Bretton Woods system to an end and rendering the dollar a fiat currency. At the same time, many fixed currencies, such as the pound sterling, also become free floating. After the collapse of the Smithsonian Agreement, the major currencies of North America, Europe, and Japan floated. During the 1970s, the dollar depreciated from inflation and then commenced its dramatic ascent, following the 1979-80 Volcker shock, when US interest rates were hiked to unprecedented levels. By 85, the dollar strength was harming US competitiveness, prompting the US, Japan, Germany, France to sign the Plaza Accord under which they jointly intervened to lower the dollar. And their intervention was so effective that they had to sign another agreement in 1987, the Louvre Accord, to stop the further fall of the dollar. Prior to these meetings, free-floating exchange rates were considered the best, but thereafter, the major countries began to cooperate more. Manage exchange rate The European Monetary System, or EMS, was created by France and Germany in 1979 to resolve these deficiencies. Participating currencies were still held within their bilateral margins of 2.25% but were now accompanied by capital controls to allow a degree of monetary policy autonomy. More importantly, a new entity, the European Monetary Fund, was established to provide credits known as ICUS to members experiencing balance of payment problems. In practice, the EMS was a douche mark central system, with German monetary policy serving as the nominal anchor. Other countries reduced their inflation towards Germany, which was the lowest in Europe, and this time, none of the participants had to withdraw, and a far greater degree of exchange rate stability was achieved, and particularly after 1985. From 2004, economists such as Michael P. Dooley, Peter M. Garber, and David Falkert's Lando begin writing papers describing the emergence of a new international system involving an interdependency between states with generally high savings in Asia, lending and exporting to western states with generally high spending. Similar to the origin of Bretton Woods, this included Asian currencies being packed to the dollar, though this time by the unilateral intervention of Asian governments in the currency market to stop their currencies appreciating. The developing world as a whole stopped running current account deficits in 1999, widely seen as a response to unsympathetic treatment following the 1997 Asian financial crisis. From 2004, this supposed new Bretton Woods was called for the elimination of the structural imbalances that underlie it, namely the chronic US current account deficit. In conclusion, while most of us compare our currencies to dollar, there is no way we're going back to bimetallism. 
unless you want to go back to the 18th century.